Welcome back, everybody, to Hacking Pro Tips number six with the Franz Rosen. Um, honored <laughs> to have the opportunity to chat with him. Uh, if you haven't already, he's got a number of presentations and an awesome podcast out uh, where he chatted with the Bug Crowd team, uh, specifically Sam over there. And so I'm hoping with this interview, we can do a deeper dive. We'll be jumping off from all the things that he's already shared, which is a crazy amount. Um, and hopefully doing a little bit of a, of a deeper dive into those themes, those concepts, and really see uh, how he took his hacking to the next level. And just before we do, again, if you're not familiar, just looking at your stats right now, friends, over at uh, Hacker One, ranked number seven <laughs> overall with 8,200 uh, <laughs> reputation. That what's awesome is 6.4 signal. Uh, if you're not familiar with Signal, it's you know I think it's minus 10 to 7, and so that puts you in the 97th percentile. And then over at Bug Crowd, 45th rank. But again, just a laundry list of companies that you've helped out, both on Bug Crowd and Hacker One. So again, thanks very much for for taking the time. I know you're outside right now, uh, whereas yeah. I'm sitting <laughs> yeah, in the I office. I am actually. <laughs> yeah. So I tend to I tend to walk outside when I speak with people, mostly because my family is like to bed already. So uh, they're sleeping and uh, I don't want to disturb them. Yeah. So it's it's easier for me to be outside in the dark. <laughs> Again, that's uh, it goes to you making the time to actually sit down with us, which is which is awesome. So I can't yeah, no uh, I can't emphasize that enough how much I appreciate that. So awesome. just to dive right into it. Um, you know, uh, we were talking before how I've, I've almost kind of stalked your history, uh, watched all their presentations, <laughs> listened to the, the conversation with Sam, and I thought we'd jump off from the stuff that you've previously talked about. So one of cool. the things um, you mentioned with Sam and you've mentioned in the presentations before is that you really got into hacking, let's, let's put that in quotes, kind of the formal hacking bug bounties, <laughs> yeah. in and around 2012, 2013, right? Yeah. And that, and yeah. that was with no experience. That was with uh, no experience, actually. Like, I, I started off as a developer, and, um, like, I, I started off with this, like, PHP forums uh, back in the days when I was still in, in high school. And uh, I knew about security. I was just not hacking anything. And I was actually just trying to build stuff that you couldn't hack. Um, looking back to back on these applications right now, they were probably so vulnerable, uh, you wouldn't imagine. Like, hopefully... <laughs> There's nothing online that I wrote back in the days. Um, so <laughs> it's actually, there's a, like an old PHP forum when I show up some stuff and I'm like, holy shit, I should not show people that. Like probably should just delete those because nah, nah, it's, it's no good. But so, so I always had like security, that, that was a serious thing and I should, you should actually like be careful. But I, I was never ever thinking about like hacking other people until I met Frederick and Matthias. And Frederick and Matthias is, is basically the two of the founders of Detectify, which is the company I work for right now. Okay. Um, so we met, we met back in the days. Uh, they were actually starting off as developers for the company that, that, I, that I also worked with, that I started. Uh, and they started off as developers and they told us that we're building something cool here. You should probably take a look at it. It's like a security automation tool that finds web vulnerabilities. And uh, I saw it and I was uh, like super stoked. Um, so we actually, uh, together with, with, uh, with, with these guys, we started off Detectify as a, as a, like a web, web, <laughs> web monitoring scanning as a service. Um, oh. So, uh, and, and back in those days, there were like no bug bounties whatsoever. So they had a hard time actually validating, like they had some friends and companies that allowed them to actually do research on them. But they, they, it was like a really hard, like it was really hard to actually find uh, companies to actually test your stuff out on. Okay. And this is when like bug bounty started. And when bug bounty started, it started off like it started off early with Google and Facebook and like Mozilla, uh, but it really took off when like PayPal and Yandex launched uh, their bug bounties. And this was, uh, th th this was like the perfect time for us as well, because we were doing a lot of research on like, how w should we be able to identify vulnerabilities the best way. And since these programs started, we, we had a, like a really good baseline to actually test out stuff on like our 
back back then, like our idea was that if if these companies are vulnerable, imagine how many other companies that are vulnerable yeah. to to similar stuff. Um, and um, they showed me a, a bunch of like tips and tricks on on how to do stuff. Um, and I started to do poking myself manually on these companies, and and suddenly I found a thing, and I was just like. Is this actually a vulnerability? And I ask them, and they're like, "Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. You should report this to to PayPal." And and then I, I like a couple of months later, I got a response, and they were telling me that yes, this is indeed a vulnerability. Um, and then like I realized how cool this was. Yeah. That being able to just try everything out on PayPal, like and responsibly actually telling them about it, and I was like, "This is so big." And uh, and I was actually approaching Google at that time a lot. Uh, I was like sitting with my iPhone everywhere, trying to do like finding XSSs on on Google. And suddenly I get a, like an XSS on Google Maps, and I was like, "Shit, this is <laughs> this is this is insane. This works." Yeah. And and then it just took off, and I started hacking all these companies. And yeah, hacking from my cell phone has been something that I started with so i'm i'm pretty i'm, I'm pretty like uh, used to used to sitting with my iphone and viewing source code and and everything and it's been it's been successful until now so it's, okay it's uh, yeah so so at the beginning was it was it primarily xss you were looking for and when you guys got together was were you yeah. all remote or were you kind of working in the same location where you had the opportunity to kind of sit down chat talk and learn yeah. from each other like what did that look like yeah, so so we we were sitting at the same location. So okay. every time you came into the office, Frederick and Matthias were sitting there with big smiles, and you're like, "What's <laughs> going on, dudes?" And they were just showing up some crazy, crazy hacks and crazy findings for, for all these companies. So it became sort of a, sort of a challenge in the beginning. Like I wanted to, to show off my skills at the same time. And yes, yeah. XSS was probably the first thing that, that I tried out. Um, and mostly because I, as a developer, realized it was so easy to forget yeah. one place where you actually just not sanitize your your input or whatever. So so that that became sort of my my first thing. And and in the beginning, I, I really not understood anything on why stuff happened. I just saw that it happened. Yeah. Uh, but then I started to figure out, okay, this is this is what happens. Can you do this? Can you do that? And like since since I've been working as a developer and also doing a lot of QA internally for our developers, I became really good at like writing reports as I would writing QA reports internally. Okay. So that helped me a lot. Like, okay, so how would I be able to tell a developer how to actually reproduce this? Hmm. Uh, so I used all that tools that I had for for like explaining that stuff, and I used that to actually report. Uh, the vulnerability because some of the vulnerabilities was like really complicated in terms of like you need to enable that you need to enable that you need to go inside this view with this browser and click this and click that so it became really easy for me to just okay how how would i explain this the easiest way possible and that was basically like step by step and i i've never i've seen people suggesting like suggesting like show the cve and, and stuff like that i've i've, I've never actually done that yeah. I, like the CV calculator for me is like I, I, I know what it does and I, I, I understand it, but it's just that I'm it's for me CV is very uh, it's very um, it depends on the person that that sets the the score because yeah. you there's some stuff that is like it's it depends on on how you see how you look at it. So it's not a really like if I calculate a score on a vulnerability and you do the same thing, we would probably not have the exactly same score. So it's very individual depending on how you look at something uh, to calculate that. So I've never like focused at all on it. I've, I've just tried to explain like how can I reproduce this issue and what could I possibly do with this issue. Yeah, and um, that, that, that seems to be a common theme that's coming out of some of the interviews that I'm doing. And I think focusing on that CVE, it leaves out what we've heard from you know conversations with Adam and, and Jason is that you need to focus on kind of what the business impact is. Not to say, yeah. here's what XSS is, but really yeah. this is how it can impact your customers. And I think that's exactly. lost with CVEs. Yes, absolutely. And that's the thing. It's very individual depending on how you score it. And it's very individual depending on the business as well. So it's, right. 
it's a it's a it's a hard thing so my my i i, I like i've done some blog posts about vulnerabilities and they look yeah. very similar to what i actually report to companies so one i i did one um <laughs> one report that i also did a blog post about which was about uh a brown shaver. <laughs> I was using yeah. <laughs> a Amazon Amazon link to trigger uh, XSS uh, for a company, and the thing was, um, I had so much pain with it, but uh, because I was spending so much time with it, I actually like th the way I actually reported this was with all that frustration I had also in the blog post. <laughs> like I'm not, I, I can't move on. Like it was almost like a, a like a timeline. Like yeah. day one, oh, hooray, I found something. Day two, damn, I can't like do anything with this. Wait three months and mm, interesting, I found a way to bypass this, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, I, and like I've seen, I've, I've, I've tried to talk around that a bit before because like on the other end, receiving the report, there's often like nerds as, as yourself and, and they, <laughs> like imagine getting a like for, like forms that look super strict and super like they want fun as well so i try try to do some fun stuff with w like with some of the reports i've i've sent in gifs <laughs> in my reports and i've done everything uh, like i'm trying to like be be like make security fun because i yeah. really do believe it's uh, this is like a really good um way to actually communicate with the other part of the companies and also like being able to meet them up later on and they're like, ha, oh, we laughed so much because you built a sucky game around the click jacking XSS. <laughs> yeah. It's hilarious. Like you love that. So but it also yeah. goes to that relationship building, just like you're talking about, right? Yeah, and, and exactly. It, uh, there's something to be said, like once you start kind of reporting to a program, I mean, I, I've only been doing it for, you know, six to eight months type thing. But yeah, once you have that established relationship, um, you can you don't have to go in and you know provide like a full structured report and you know, exactly. everything's got to be formalized yeah you understand uh, who's on the other side they understand who you are yeah um, yeah and that goes a long way right absolutely and and I think it's like you shouldn't it, it, it like since you know which ones are on the other side it makes it a lot easier to actually be very like funny or or like almost jokingly about stuff but if you don't know that the people on the other side, that that tends to be very risky. So I tend to yeah. be like really formal in the beginning, and then expand about like stuff, and then move over to a more personal connection. So it's a, uh, it's actually like you build up connections with the people on the other side. You start following them on Twitter, they following you, yeah. and you start building a relationship, and that relationship becomes super easy in the in the end when you're just like poking them, like should I report this or not? Yeah, exactly, um, exactly. And and because that will save a bunch of work as well, like on both instead sides. Of, yeah, exactly. So yeah. instead of me writing a really really large report, I poke one of the guys working there and like, should I report this? And they're like, hell yeah, do that. Yeah. And then I just like, yeah, I talk with this guy and like he knows about it. You should probably fix this. And it becomes so much easier to actually um, to to actually do the communication in terms of like patching vulnerabilities in general. Exactly. Yeah. So. Just um, one of the questions that occurred to me when you were kind of describing your, your early work with Matthias and with Frederick, and yep. you guys were building Detectify. So yep. I've, I've noticed now in some of your talks, there's, there's you mentioned automation and some of that automated, um, sc not scanning, but some of the tools that you're using. And so I'm yep. wondering, did Detectify help you in that? Was the idea when you guys were doing this was, how can we find this, but also at the same time, how can we replicate this at scale if we're going to be doing a SaaS service? Yeah, so it's it's a little bit uh, like in both sides, um, how to say, like it's a mutual relationship, uh, okay. so to speak. So in the beginning, like Detectify has always been focused on like you get a customer that wants to know if their service is secure, they sign up and they start scanning that or we start monitoring that service. Right. So in, in, in that sense, it's often like very limited in scope and it's like they, they want these domains and that domains. Compare that to, to bug bounty hunting where you actually want to scan tw like 2,500 domains at the yeah. same time and, and wants to find like, you, if you find a vulnerability in one end, you want to try to find out as soon as possible if others are affected by the similar thing. So it's, it's I would say like in the beginning, 
we we built out like really easy patterns to identify XSSs and and like all these sort of vulnerabilities and we found like methodologies to like crawl crawl web pages and like remove all the the content instead of like working with with content as a real crawler does or a, a normal crawler does we worked with like the heuristics of the page and mm. and started to figure out a lot of stuff around like the structure which meant that we could ignore a p bunch of pages to just scan the relevant ones which has different templates and stuff yeah. so uh, it's a bit different i would say in terms of like using that automation for for bug hunting okay. but what we've seen is like uh, what happens right now when we're at the stage we're in right right now like as soon as we find vulnerabilities or I found vulnerabilities and the other guys find vulnerabilities we tend to like implement them inside the, the tool so we, we're able to fingerprint the same sort of stuff to make our our service better nice. um, but like in the beginning we we asked these companies like Yandex for example like can we use our scanner uh, to try it out and they're like, yeah, sure. And we found some vulnerabilities and uh, using the scanner. And we had as a as a rule that every time the scanner found a vulnerability that paid out a bounty, we would use that bounty to buy a branded cake from that company. <laughs> so <laughs> so we we've eaten Yandex cake, we've eaten Barracuda cake, uh, and we're like we're eating a bunch of different cakes uh, depending on the companies that we actually use the scanning tool uh, internally just to see if it works like yeah. can we actually make a proof of concept out of it and it has worked it's just that t today is super hard to get companies to allow you to scan stuff yeah. because they're like yeah because everybody's hammering us with econetics or or whatever so please don't scan us with stuff because we we know what our problems are however we see a lot of bug bounty companies actually using detectify as one of their outer perimeters nice. uh, in terms of like identifying stuff. So we have a bunch of companies that both using bug bounty and using using Detectify as a service. So it's um, um, th that's a, like a big thing right now, like having all these stuff because they can also benefit from from getting uh, similar, like as soon as we find issues, we can actually shoot them out to these companies and like automatically tell them about these issues but it's, an, it's not that many we have a few at least so nice yeah. <laughs> that's awesome yeah um so the other thing uh that has occurred to me is um kind of your transition from starting to kind of where you're at now um i don't want to say it's been a massive leap but obviously you're you're doing extremely <laughs> well now um i don't know if that was the case back then but no. <laughs> um one of the things you talked about with sam was the fact that when you're looking at a site Sometimes you come across a site that just looks vulnerable. Like you you huh? know just the way that they've coded it. Yeah. Now, is that do you still think that's the case? Is that still what you're coming across when you're getting the new private invites? You're working on the new programs with Hacker One and Full Crowd. Um. Yes, but okay. it's like mostly in terms of legacy. Like as soon as you f you get get invited to a new program or whatever, like you start to doing recon, and that yeah. recon often tells you about if they still have old assets online. Um. Uh, and having the old assets online, you, you're probably able to, to get that feeling again. Like, okay, they're using Cold Fusion here. Um, that should probably be vulnerable in some sense. Like, you can, you can, um, you can still get that feeling. And, and like, I know Matthias and Frederick actually used that term when they started doing um, uh, bug bounties for Google. And the thing was, back then, Google had these old... Uh, like old um, applications online and mm. they were able to find like an XAC on the Google toolbar yeah. which actually if you watched it back then when everything was like web 2.0 and you watched the Google toolbar you felt that this is so much older than than everything else mm. that Google has online so I would say that um, as soon as you see like okay this one is using tables as as right. as they're design, yeah. designing, <laughs> like then then you get like okay a first hunch that something is wrong, yeah, um, and then you just start digging digging further and further. But as soon as you see like a normal REST based API yeah. web app, like you don't of course you don't get that feeling, but like um, there, there's there's some signals to it. Like I have this thing where where numeric uh, IDs is like something that I really get turned on by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Because like independently of what company you are, it doesn't matter. Like HackerOne has, 
have had that problem uh, with like minor things, of course, but still yeah. they've had the problem. Uh, so as soon as you see like numeric IDs and, and like remember that hacker one is like hackers from yeah. the beginning yeah. uh, and they still get it wrong. Of course, everybody gets it wrong sometimes. So as soon as you get numeric IDs, I'm just like, I'm going to stay here until I find something related to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you're hundred percent right. You just, it's like the light bulb went off for me, right? Like yeah. I, there's, there's been those things where, yeah, I've been working on a site and all of a sudden you see like user one, two, three. And until now, it's kind of like, yeah, that, that you know, yeah. you get turned on. You're like, oh, this is there's probably going to be something here. There's going to be yeah. some kind of insecure direct object reference that absolutely. I can go after. And, and the thing is, like, there's so many levels to it. Like one level being that you're actually exposing the amount of information that exists in your in your system. Like yeah. that actually for for some companies, that's actually relevant to to know. Yeah. So I've been reporting, depending on the company, of course, but I've re re been reporting to, like, I, I, I tend to do the comparison, like, a regular bank and a Bitcoin, a Bitcoin exchange. So a yeah. Bitcoin exchange doesn't really matter that you have uh, being able to watch other transactions or calculate the amount of transactions being done on the exchange. However, looking at a bank, being able to calculate how many transactions there is, is actually super super significant and actually not not something that they want to expose so so i've seen some instances where you have like an exchange for for stock market or stuff like that that you're actually able to to tell them that okay i'm i'm able to identify that every day you have this amount of transactions and they're like yeah. oh, holy shit can you just figure that out by the numbers and i'm like yeah that's what number does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so, exactly. So, so it's um, it's on so many levels, and also like there's a, the, uh, like also working with this is like there's a REST specification telling you that you should use a 404 as soon as the content doesn't exist, and a right. 40, 402 or whatever 403 maybe for a forbidden where where you know that content exists but you're not able to show it. Uh, that is also one way of actually figuring out like how many objects is there, how many objects are actually deleted versus exist but you don't have access to them. So only by using the REST specification error codes you're able to gather a bunch of data from a company that could be business critical. Yeah, exactly. And again, so, I, mean, I feel like we keep harping on it, but that's where the business application side of it goes, right? Where yes, you absolutely. need to make that judgment call and be able to understand that, identify that, and then articulate it. Absolutely, absolutely, and also like in the reverse, like a company not using IDs uh, or numeric IDs. Like uh, I, I've seen some instances where where you feel like, hey, they're using hashes. That's awesome, but but because of them using hashes, they become they become really um, like uh, what to say? Like they become uh, they feel safe because right. oh, the hash ID will, will never be revealed to anybody else. Yep. So they don't they don't care about their access layer that much. Yeah. But what happens is that as soon as they start expose those use the, those hashes externally, uh, you're able to like use them to actually create a, a insecure direct object reference just because they thought that the IDs wasn't exposed. Yeah, exactly. So, they think like, it's I've obscure enough that you don't, no one's going to ever yeah. find it, but they end yeah. up leaking it somewhere. Exactly, exactly. And and only because they were using a safe method of of creating these uh, IDs, they thought that we don't need to care about the the access layer that much because we don't expose our IDs, which suddenly they do later on in building their product. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I, one of the things I wanted to, to dive deeper on was you mentioned the recon where you've got a new yeah. private invite. And so for me, like, you know, I'm starting to get into that more now. But when you say recon, like, what does that mean to you? Like, I think of, you know, maybe Nmap, you know, sublister, looking at different subdomains. Yeah. Um, what, what does it mean to you when you say um, doing your recon? Yeah, so so it's similar. Like, I, I tend to use, like, I have a subroot, which I've, like, hacked on not knowing about any Python at all, <laughs> just <laughs> hammering it and doing my own stuff with it. Yeah. So it's, it's very similar to, to like Sublister and, and all these other tools and like it's based on, on Subroot anyway. So I, I tend to use that to just map up what, what this, com this company actually have. And then um, like I use VFAS, WFAS, which is like one way of doing 
word lists. Like if you have a, th th there's a bunch of word lists out there, but you're able yeah. to like figure out paths in the, in the applications or in the subdomains. Like there, you can find some really weird paths using that. Uh, also, there's um, um, there's a bunch of like services where like sometimes you won't find like subroot won't find anything for you. There there's like DNS DB, there's uh, virus total, DNS dumpster. Yeah. Um, there are a bunch of a bunch of, of solutions. I've also mentioned uh, one service called Similar Web, which mm. is like shit expensive, mm. um, which we actually exposed, uh, which was kind of hilarious. So <laughs> we we saw that that Similar Web was like having so many subdomains that they actually found like a a local local subdomain we only used for for test cases, and we were like, what? Why is this happening? Yeah. So we, we met them at a convention and, and asked them, like, why do you have our private internal subdomains listed as assets um, for this domain? And suddenly it, 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 they tell us that they're using Chrome plugins for it and oh. extensions. So we started looking at Chrome extensions and saw that they were actually leaking a bunch of data uh, around what you're actually uh, visiting and what you're clicking on and not clicking on and everything about you. So we did a large uh, blog post a few, I, th I think it was like one and a half year back or something, exposing similar web and telling everybody that that using Chrome extensions, they're leaking so many, so much data about you. And uh, it was actually pretty cool because uh, after that article, uh, the Chrome, uh, the, the Chrome Web App Store actually changed their terms oh. uh, earlier this year, so you're not able to do the same thing anymore. Huh. Um, and you need to explicitly ask for permission to gather that data. You can't do an opt-out solution anymore uh, using Chrome extensions, which is awesome. So, yeah. so like all, all the ones that we reported got shut down. Also, using the the Firefox uh, uh, like extension um, platform, there were a couple of ones getting shut down as well. And um, yeah, so <laughs> we actually like uh, crippled one of the tools that we were actually using for for identifying uh, <laughs> systems. But it made sense because it was yeah. like exposing so much data for for all people. It was like. We can't make this like go, go uh, unknown by yeah. like there was, it was it was uh, crazy and like there was um, like Dropbox actually enabled some some ways to turn off like shared links and like there was a bunch of of these um, um, like uh, how do you say like ripple effects right. of that blog post which was awesome. Yeah, that would be awesome, right? Because, I mean, yeah. you actually see the... That's one of the things with bug bounties, right? You actually see the impact on what you're doing um, yeah. and within the broader context, right, of, of actually helping people. Absolutely. And, like, the, the most valuable thing is when you actually make a big change. Like, you, you, yeah. you make one, one, like one company more secure, but in the end, you're actually making a bunch of more companies secure, even though that wasn't, like, the the purpose in the beginning when you yeah. were testing one company. So I had this the same same thing with uh, I was actually doing maybe I mentioned it before, but I did a talk around uh, I, I was supposed to go to a conference talking about Python. Okay. And and like security stuff in Python and I <laughs> I didn't know anything about like <laughs> the Python frameworks or whatever. So I yeah. was like super scared that I was like <laughs> not knowing anything. So before that event I was actually like okay trying to figure out what can I do? So I started poking around with these frameworks. And one of these frameworks was Flask. And in the beginning, it said, we have a debug mode. You should never put this online. <laughs> and and my first th thought was, I'm going to check who's put this online. And yeah. there were so many companies doing it. And like one of this, those companies was Patreon. And uh, like it, 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 it was... Like, this is a long story, but it ended up in being me reporting it to Patreon because they were vulnerable to a remote code execution because of this. And uh, what happened was that they didn't respond in almost a week. And when they responded, they said, like, oh, we're going to fix it. Uh, uh, we know it's stupid. Uh, we're going to fix it as soon as possible. And then one week, one week went by, and suddenly they went out and saying that they've been hacked. 
hmm. and all their source code is out, all their members, ev all the database is out, everything is leaked. And, and when they told everybody about it, I just felt that this is the case. This was how they got hacked. Yeah. Because it's like if you search for Patreon on Shodan, it yeah. just had a big sign like we are vulnerable. <laughs> and, and press here to, to insert your Python code. Um, so what happened was that we actually went out with a blog post saying like this is how they got hacked. Yeah. Because we realized that somebody is actually weaponizing this bug uh, yeah. into like hacking a bunch of companies and leaking their data. Yeah. So what happened after that, like we, we found a, 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 lot, a lot more companies being vulnerable to the same thing. One of them was, was Uber, actually. Oh. And the cool thing was that uh, compared to Patreon, Uber was actually, as soon as we told them, they're like, we saw your blog post and we thought about it and we didn't reflect that much about it. But I actually took a cab from the gym just to go to the office and patch this. <laughs> uh, which which he did. So he passed it in a few hours on a Saturday Saturday like afternoon, yeah. just because they were like, "Holy shit, this is actually somebody's actually abusing this." And now Detective Files reported it to us being us being vulnerable. So it was like a huge, like the realization at that time, like, "Holy shit, there can be so much more breaches to this that it's not good at all." Uh, was was pretty pretty significant actually but really? what happened was that the the the, the application the work sucked debugger actually fixed it so what they did was actually add a pin code so you're not able to see that console by default you need to have a pin code that is generated by the back end so you, if you're externally uh, finding this you're not able to abuse it because you need to know this this pin code uh, okay. which is kind of cool so that actually modified how the application worked to be more secure. Nice. Which in the end, like, made all, 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 a lot more companies not being vulnerable to this anymore. Well, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And just just for those listening that aren't familiar, Shodan is kind of like your internet search engine for the Internet of Things, quote unquote. Right. Yeah. So you can go out and you can. I haven't used it as much, but you can go out and you can look at the banners for like servers and and find different devices yeah. that are online and and whatnot. So that's yeah, kind of what totally. you did there with the with uh, exactly because there was a header telling you that it had the WorkSug debugger on, right? So yeah, yeah. well, there's another recon tool for those that are listening. Is showed it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then, um, just before we move on from this, so we talked about yeah. kind of like the internal IDs that you're looking at, uh, the HTML table based. Is there any specific functionality that kind of gets your blood going? Uh, like for me learning now I have the developer background as well and so I love to see the team based stuff because I figure people always screw up roles and there will always yeah. be something that's vulnerable there is there anything Absolutely. similar for you um, yeah so I, I agree on the team thing like that that creates a lot of attack surface in terms of like what are what our team um, members able to do and yeah. uh, also also in terms of like like I've been poking around with like custom custom domains and and all these stuff. Like I've I've been finding so many instances where, like there was a was a company launching like now you can create your own website and you add your own domain to this and you get it branded as you want to, uh, but but the problem was that they didn't have any conflict check. So like mm. being able to like add the same domain as somebody else just took it over from them and you were able to serve your content on that domain. So in terms of like custom domains, and I, I think we're going to speak a little bit more about that regarding like subdomain takeover and stuff like that. Yeah. It's just that working with that, that thing, uh, like because a lot of companies start off by like offering a service and then you're able to like customize that service into to like brand it yourself and do whatever. So as soon as people start doing that, there's so many things that could go wrong. Uh, so that that turns me on for sure. Um, also, like being able to to like, and and that's one way of doing it. But like, if if you have a service and that service is able to like publish something publicly, like, for example, like you can you can say like Optimizely has the thing when you embed your uh, JavaScript to your page to be able to modify it. Uh, it's it's uh, that that gets me gets me going because mm -hmm. like that creates a new attack surface on all these all these systems that, or all these websites that embeds that content into the page. 
So like as as soon as a company offers like thir- like JavaScripts or whatever that you can embed yeah. on your own web page or public pages or um, they, you can create a public page or whatever. Like there's so many that that creates a huge uh, another way of, of creating like huge attack surface for 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 a, for an attacker or or for me finding vulnerabilities in it. Um, yeah. So so that's also something that I that I like. Also like. One 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 of the things that gets me going, like I tend to, as soon as I get a new program, I tend to do like report a few vulnerabilities just to like see how they respond, see yeah. how they actually like talk with you. And something that I've realized that that turns me on a lot is like response times. Yes. As as soon as I need to wait like more than a week for yeah. a new n- new launch, that that turns me off a lot. Um, so whenever I, I get a company that actually like are quickly on responding on stuff, that makes me super interested into digging further. Um, just because you want that connection, you want that yeah. you want to like communicate with the other end. Um, I've I've had companies that maybe th- they're not super fast to respond, but I know some people on that that company having them on Slack or on Skype, uh, just just pinging them about like some stuff that I found interesting. Just to like get a response back from the, from that company. Yeah. Um, so so like response times is like probably more interesting to me than than payout amounts. Like I've had some some companies that they they didn't pay that much, mm-hmm. but what happened was that they were like, as soon as you come to San Francisco, tell us because we want to eat dinner with you. Yeah. And so and I came over to San Francisco and we had an awesome time and I got to meet the team and one of the guys was actually uh, going to Stockholm so I met him up and we took a coffee and like talked a little bit around like vulnerabilities and in general and that guy actually moved over to another company having bug bounties so that ended up in being like uh, now I can report stuff to that company because I know who's on the other side and I know yeah. that they're going to respond super fast on it. So it creates this, uh, back back to what we talked about before, it creates this like relationship with the companies exactly. that is like th- probably more interesting than than getting huge payouts. Of course, huge payouts is awesome. Like that yeah. gets you turn on as well. But exactly. the response times is, for me at least, more valuable than than um, uh, than the amounts. Yeah, and uh, really that, I mean, hopefully there are people that are listening to this that are administering programs because that, that really can't be overstated, right? Like we're, no. like from the hacking perspective, like we're putting in our time, the same way that they're putting in their time to set up the program, but we're sitting down yeah. in our spare time for the most part um, yeah. and doing this and then submitting reports and then to have them kind of just go off into the abyss. Like there's nothing yeah. that's more frustrating than that. Absolutely. And, and it's like, um, it doesn't really... It doesn't necessarily mean that they need to fix them in yeah, exactly. uh, like urgently. They, they can just like respond like, "Holy shit, this is awesome! Yep. Thank you so much!" And like, um, th- th- that's enough. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily need to get them to pay out on triage. Like, I think that's a good thing though. Like, yeah. being able to just like we've validated this this thing and it's actually valid. We know the the attack surface of this vulnerability, so we're gonna pay you out. And then we'll tell you when we fixed it, but we're gonna pay you out before. Like that's awesome. But most importantly, being able to just tell me that, oh, we got it. Like this is awesome. And just tell me, like we have a sprint in in three months. Yeah. We'll probably fix it back uh, then. But now we know this is awesome. Thank you. Like that's enough for me. Exactly. That's that's, that's um, yeah, super important. No, I completely agree. Baby steps, right? Like if we can just get yeah. companies to respond. Uh, have that open yeah. communication, the bug, you know, paying on triage and, and that kind of stuff. Like the money will come eventually. Yeah, um, exactly. But yeah, just have those communication channels open. Uh, I completely yeah. agree. Um, so just before we move on from the topic, one thing that has interested me actually quite a bit is some of the conversations that we've had in some of the other channels and Skype and whatnot. Is I know that you'll kind of go back to a program, um, and you talked about it, yeah. kind of having that relationship. And so, yeah. what what does that threshold look like? Like, when is it? When do you move on to kind of the other new private programs? And then, what kind of brings you back? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, do you just hit the reset button, or are there specific mm-hmm. things you go back for when a program's been established? It's an awesome question. Like. Um, it's 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 really hard to figure out exactly what makes me go back to a program. Um, some some like some programs tend to to like tease my interest more than others. Yeah. Um, I like 
having having signed up to all these services makes <laughs> me like my my inbox is probably so full of like newsletters uh, from all these companies. It's like um, so I can go inside that inbox and just like oh well this was long time ago watching yeah. this program and like some of the companies. I always tend to start at. So I have one company called Prezi, uh, which has yeah. their, they have, have like their own uh, way of doing bug bounties. They don't use any program uh, or a marketplace or whatever. They just host it themselves. And, and they're like, I know for a fact that they like always respond uh, in like, at like maximum 24 hours. And their scope is like so wide. So, and they have really? all these weird services online. And they're like, um so much fun to poke at them <laughs> and and so so that like as soon as i get a newsletter from them <laughs> i always i always tend to like poke them a little bit uh yeah. and i have I have some of those companies i tend to tend to like revisit so so one of the triggers for me is actually the newsletters which is hilarious mm. but it actually works uh, quite well um also like Google has this thing where they pay you out each month. Uh, at least, like they, they have it for some people. So I get like a, a researcher's grant each month, and they tell me what type of new assets they have uh, oh. that you should be able to poke at, and that's like super valuable. I, I would love to see more programs do that. Yeah, uh, especially programs having a, a bunch of assets online or deploying huge functionalities or new functionality online. Um, so, so they tell you like, okay, this month we actually released this stuff. You should probably poke, poke at this, hmm. this, uh, this stuff. And like, that's super interesting. And I know Fresi for a fact, tried to do that in the beginning. I don't think they've like tried been able to manage it, uh, hundred percent, but all these companies being able to like, tell you what they're built, like have built on recently is like super interesting. So that's also one of the reasons why newsletters work pretty good <laughs> because nice. sometimes you want to like uh, uh, say that you have a new functionality, they have like a newsletter telling you about it. Yep. Um, so Etsy, yep. yeah, Etsy, for example, is also like they, they introduce new functionality and, and the only reason why I looked at it because was they, they sent out a newsletter telling everybody that they had new functionality. Hmm. Um, so, so that tends to be a, a, a good indicator. And also like having, having all these people, you know, on the, on these companies, you, you tend to like go back to them because th there, it's so much fun poking at stuff when you know the people on the other, other side. Yeah. Um, so, so I tend to like mostly go, go for those programs where I know people on the other side, actually, because hmm. it's just so much fun to actually write because then you know what the response is going to be yeah um so yeah that's uh, that's super well but i have one company i i don't i don't know if they like like to mention the name but i i have a friend there uh and uh, i tend to like revisit them a couple of times a year and every time i just like hey guys no biggie but here's a thing that you should know about and they're like yeah, same PayPal address. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that's hilarious. And I'm like, stop paying me money. I just wanna like, I, I, I like you guys, and I want you guys to be secure. Yeah. I'm not doing this all, only for the money, but like, I'm, I'm doing this because I, I like you guys also. So, that's kind of funny. Like, it's a, it's a fun relationship. <laughs> it's yeah, a bit, no. like skewed, but it's, it's fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, on that note, friends, when you go back. And say you're looking at these sites, um, and this kind of bleeds into another question. But yeah. um, if you had a ballpark, like what, what does your time look like? Because I know you've talked about you spend a lot of time on recon, and and then maybe you'll you know find some volunteers that leave into another volunteer. Mm -hmm. But what, like, what does it look like? Like, how many hours have you had to guess are you spending before you report, or is it even that 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 many? Um, it depends. Like. Um... I, I had a talk where I like exposed all my <laughs> all my methodologies yeah um, and from the security fest in in Gothenburg uh, before the summer yeah. and it's basically like that like I tend to like go through the just like proxy everything and just mm -hmm. walk through the app go 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 through everything and then just uh, like 
try to look like do they have open redirects like that's a super basic thing yeah so, so a lot of the companies doesn't care but as soon as you like f find out are they trying to prevent an open redirect or yeah. are they just don't care at all like as soon as you find that they're actually have do, done some mitigations for it that that is absolutely something i start looking at because if i see that they've had some mitigations for an open redirect i know for a fact that they don't want an open redirect yeah. Um, so, so starting looking at that, as soon as I'm able to actually bypass that, I'm trying to figure out why did they did they not want to have an open redirect here? Okay, so that you can sign in with Facebook, for example. Yeah. And there's a known fact that as soon as you create a, like a Facebook Connect button, you need to be able to like you need to whitelist the specific redirect URIs that you need for for uh, for the app that you actually create the Facebook connect with yeah. and uh, if, if you're able to actually utilize the open redirect you found using the Facebook connect you're able to take over other people's accounts on this service or actually being able to control their content inside Facebook yeah exactly. so that tends to be like one of the reasons why people mitigate open redirects um, another thing is like as soon as I've been proxying all the stuff that I've done I try to poke at those requests, trying to see how they respond. Like they could be all from like this. This stuff is returned back as a JSON. Can I make it return back as <laughs> JavaScript, for example? Oh. Or can I make it uh, respond back as XML? Can I actually post XML instead of JSON? Like yeah. uh, all these weird type of things. Like I've seen some vulnerabilities lately that they were doing. They were doing. Um, uh, as soon as you, uh, let's see how they did it. They actually had put requests when you want, wanted to modify objects. Yeah. Um, but what happened was that when you created post request, that means that you want to create that object instead. Yeah. But if, if you were using a post request to the same URL that you were doing the put request to, you were able to claim that object as yours, <laughs> even though it wasn't. So, so doing these all sorts of, of changes and like looking at how the application behaves as soon as you start fiddling around with it, yeah. you can find some really, really weird stuff. Um, also, like uh, looking at REST APIs, there's a bunch of like you, you maybe have seen this like you have uh, uh, like a project slash your project slash um, object slash the ID of the object. Yeah. Um, and that means that the route is probably validating that the object is, is inside that project. Yeah. But if you maybe remove project slash your project name and only go for object slash the ID of the object, maybe they have one of those routes as well yeah. that doesn't really check the, the relation between the, the user trying to do stuff and uh, the project that it's, that it's uh, like contained with. So huh. there's a bunch of these like checking out all the routes yeah, and also looking at like okay, there's a bunch of post and put requests to specific routes, but no gets. So I've seen this like yeah, uh, you you create a new object uh, and you you post to a specific route, but if you try a get on that on that route, you get all the objects for all the customers or all the company. Like I've been getting like REST responses like 45 megabytes big yeah. because they forgot to add the access layer on the get uh, yeah. route. So just focusing on like and and it it gets so interesting. I will probably just try to blog about that specific thing because testing REST APIs is is so much fun, both in yeah. terms of like finding routes that wasn't supposed to be online or active. I've seen so many like test uh, routes that that is just exposing all. <laughs> I had one one REST API was like uh, you ask for a token, um, and what happened was that in that 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 endpoint wasn't visible anywhere. But I found it through like WeFast or whatever. Yeah. And and when I looked at it, it has had a username and a password, <laughs> and I signed in on the service with that username and a password, and it turned out to be like a QA thing so the the qa people went to this page got the username and password and was able to sign into the service uh, and to use it yeah and what happened was that they had saved so much data about the the company that i was able to escalate it into their jira 
So I was able to log into their Jira, yeah. and I was like, should I write this report by posting a new Jira <laughs> ticket, or should I report it <laughs> through their bug bounty program? Yeah. So I, I, I reported it through the bug bounty program, but it was like super, super interesting just finding this route that was just exposing some weird data that you couldn't really understand why it was exposed at all. Yeah. No, it's, and it's good that you mentioned that because, I mean, we, I guess it's not recent anymore, but within the last couple of months, like those are some of the vulnerabilities on HackerOne, right? Where yeah. they're using Rails and what I can only assume is scaffolding was at play, but they had an object where if you called it for JSON, it just returned a, a ton of information on that object as yeah. opposed to just the fields that you want to get. Um, yeah. And I mean, for those listening, that for me, that's kind of what gets me going too is when I see it's a Rails site because I know yeah. <laughs> how Rails does their path, right? It's always yeah. uh, convention, right? And so yeah. you're going to have those those rest routes. And uh, if you throw a dot .json on the end of there, sometimes exactly. you end up getting some objects that you're not supposed to be getting, right? You might get a yeah. 404 on the HTML, but yeah. on the JSON, you're, you're gold. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like, I think uh, GitLab had a similar thing yeah. where, where when, when you were, like, exporting the project, as a zip file inside the, the data in the zip file, you had the tokens for all the that's, users. That's right. Yeah, Yobert uh, reported that one. Yo, Yobert, yeah, Yobert, yeah. Yobert, find it, and that meant basically remote code execution. But because being an admin on a GitLab was basically it was possible to run code on the instance. So it's, yeah. it's hilariously fun. Exactly. Exactly. So switching yeah. gears a bit here, um, mm -hmm. you had talked about with Sam um, that you kind of you you haven't participated in capture the flags and that kind of thing and that's been one learning tool that i've heard from other people um yeah. but i'm curious like how do, how do you level up like if you want to is it just a matter of reading the blogs being active on twitter or yeah. is, do you have a specific like do you go somewhere for knowledge um yeah so like? i read a lot <laughs> i read so much i'm like almost tired because of yeah. I, I read so lot so so what happens is that be not having this as a profession like a profession or like not working with this professionally at all just doing it as a hobby yeah. uh, makes it possible to me to just freeze for a for a week or two yeah. just just collecting information about stuff so i combined with like i have all these um testing stuff that is like daily looking at all the assets out there and collecting the data about about all the domains having bug bounties. So yeah. as soon as I find these like blog posts around a vulnerability or something, I'm able to just like go inside my like my my machine of collecting all this data and yeah. query that data just to figure out which companies that could be affected by it. Um, wow. So one one example was like there was a vulnerability in an old version of Express.js. Yeah, uh, and what happened was that there was a guy on Hacker One. I don't, I don't recall his name, but he was like, "Oh, so there's a vulnerability in Express.js. Here's the, um, here's the, um, uh, the pull request on GitHub explaining the issue, and you guys are vulnerable to, to, um, uh, like, uh, response, like had the response splitting." Yeah. Um, so you guys are vulnerable to it, and this is how it works. And I was like, "Okay, so let's query all the." The, the companies that use this Express and see what happens if you do the same thing. And I was able to just find some of those uh, assets that was actually hosting uh, an old version of Express. So that's like a super easy way to actually utilize the collection of, of data around all these um, systems to like be fast on, on reporting vulnerabilities to companies. Like, that's one way of doing it. Um, another way is like, as soon as you find that, okay, so there's a, there has been a vulnerability in Express.js, you start doing the similar thing for, for, for other platforms. Like, can I, can I do a similar thing? And, like, yeah. and, and it, also, it also went out, um, like some, some guy found a similar thing in, an, in like how you can miss, miss, um, like do a misconfiguration of Nginx. Um, and it was basically one of the same things. Like doing that misconfiguration, you were able to like inject uh, response headers. Hmm. Um, so, and that was that was something that I actually d did a, a bunch of like research on because a, a few years back I met one of the core PHP developers, and I was like <laughs> poking at him because I know for a fact that the parse URL function in PHP is is not like secure at all. Yeah. 
And I was poking at him, why, why are you doing this? And he was like, what? Is it vulnerable? And I'm like, yeah, look at this. Like, if you do backslash, uh, it will still think it's a part of the, uh, of the user and password part of a URL. But a browser will, will like, change that to a forward slash. And you're, forward slash, and you're able to just, uh, like, do a, a open redirect or whatever. Yeah. And he actually he actually patch, patched that uh, when I met him and like <laughs> sent in a patch to PHP. So like the latest version of PHP is is safe uh, from it. But the cool thing was that he was like, ah, oh, there's a there's a misconfiguration in Nginx. I think like everybody is probably vulnerable to it. And I was like, this is super interesting. And I didn't yeah. think about it. Uh, like I I didn't do any research around it. And then one guy posts a vulnerability for. I think it was like OK.ru or whatever, like yeah. mentioning this. And I'm like, holy shit, this is the thing he mentioned for me a few years back. And then I was like, like, OK, I need to see if this is actually vulnerable to more companies. And it turned out it was so many companies being vulnerable to that specific Nginx misconfiguration, which was like hilariously uh, interesting because I also knew exactly how to actually mitigate the, the thing. So I was like, yeah. you guys are using URI instead of request URI. And URI is not like it actually um, uh, like it decodes all the characters, and which is possible then for Nginx to insert arbitrary headers, which is yeah. insane. But it's like it was actually a a, a real real issue, um, and it was very very frequently out there. Um, so so that's like reading a bunch of stuff. Also, being able to query old data and and like for all these companies creates a huge, a quick way of like finding out which companies that are vulnerable. Crazy. So it's kind of like your own like lack of a better term like spider type thing where it goes out. Yeah, basically, I'm like curling all the assets and saving all the responses. So I'm like grabbing in in a directory with like so many so many files. But it's like it's it works for me. I, I don't have a database or whatever. I'm just saving the responses and grabbing them as soon as I want to find something. And I save all the headers and the redirects and and all this stuff. And and that also like in terms of these subdomain things, I have like 20 fingerprints or something, uh, depending on what type of subdomain uh, patterns I look for. So I'm able to like identify new assets as soon as they turn up being vulnerable. Um, on yeah. that note, um, when we met in Vegas, um, mm -hmm. and I'm very conscious of your time because we're coming up on the hour mark, so uh, oh, no worry. I won't uh, won't keep you too much longer. But when we talked in Vegas, um, the the topic of the book came up: shameless plug, web hacking 101. <laughs> um, and so, honestly, subdomain takeovers is is probably your baby, right? And it's got its own chapter in there. <laughs> and uh, I'm actually going to add a, another example to it based on your legal robot example. Yeah, because yeah, I think yeah. there's some huge okay, takeaways from that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but you, you had mentioned that you know you we, we should probably beef up that chapter. Um, yeah. And so, what does absolutely. that look like to you? So uh, I have a blog post in my queue, uh, which is going to explain about all the right now the currently uh, the currently vulnerable services that does this wrong, um, right. and I'm going to explain exactly how to identify those and to like explain a bit like w because the problem is that it has still been very little information about exactly how and when people are vulnerable to it and mm -hmm. one of the examples of this is actually the first <laughs> the first um, example uh, about sub subdomains in the book because if you actually take a look in in the setup or in the actual the first report that this guy sent, um, that domain is not vulnerable. <laughs> huh. But but the thing is, because the difference is that what it says is that this domain doesn't have a website configuration, right. which is not the same thing as this is no bucket exists. Yeah. So so there's a there's and and the the reason why they probably like patched it in quotes and and paid him for it because they probably forgot about this uh, bu bucket anyway mm. and but they 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 weren't able to so so what i will try to explain is that if you can't really show people or make a real proof of concept that you're actually yeah. able to take it over uh, you can't really prove to anybody that it's actually vulnerable yeah um, and i've talked to a bunch of like at least like some of the 
gatekeepers of, of bug crowd uh, managed bounties that they actually are getting so many reports about subdomain takeovers without actually proof of concepts. Yeah. Uh, which is in general mostly false positives. Yeah. Um, and like you could argue that a company getting notified that they probably have a domain that they forgot about, uh, which is not basically claimable, but it's just that they forgot about it and what they will do is actually remove it. You mm -hmm. could argue that they should actually pay out the bounty because they actually acted on something that the reporter sent in, independently yeah. of if you were able to claim it or not. Yeah. Um, so, so I would say like there needs to be some form of clarification on on when this is possible and and not possible. And I've been wrong. Like I saw one of the reports for Uber using Smartly. Yeah. Uh, Smartling. Smartling. Yeah. Yeah. Smartling. And I was like, this is not possible. But yeah. what happened was that. He actually found, uh, because Smartling back in the days was not vulnerable. Uh, but what happened was that Smartling actually enhanced their service, so you were able to go inside and claim it yourself without actually getting in contact with a person. Yeah. Um, and so that turned out to actually be vulnerable. Uh, yeah. And I was like, no, it's not possible, because back in the day you were able to, you, you had to like contact them and do a bunch of social engineering pretending to be at that company, yeah. which was not like, that uh, like that severe because you had to actually social engineer and that's probably exactly. like out of scope also yeah so so i turned out to be wrong at that time because he was actually able to to put his content on that domain um so i think that that needs to be the the clear indication that something is wrong as soon as you actually are able to prove it uh, that should be a, a clear vulnerability but if you can't uh, I think that should not be the case. So Sendesk, for yeah. example, I've always told people that Sendesk is actually one of the uh, one of the companies doing it properly. And uh, w w what they did was actually, as soon as you signed up for a for like a company name dot sendesk dot com, okay. uh, if you cancel that service, you weren't able to claim the same type of company name again. Uh, so if you had example.sendex.com and you cancel the service, nobody else could claim example.sendex.com. Oh, really? And, and what happened was that if you went inside the service and tried to claim example.com pointing to Sendesk, it told you that, no, this needs to be, you need to have example.sendex.com for this to work. But what has happened, uh, I think something has happened since then, because I've seen so many new instances now where you're actually able to go inside and claim that same company name again. So I don't know if they just like create a, a they purged all the canceled ones just to make room for new ones or whatever, but something happened. So I've seen more instances of vulnerable Sendesks now than I did back in the days when you actually um, like found this thing from the beginning. Huh. Um, so, so stuff is like stuff is happening <laughs> all over. Um, and like the, the, like one of the most, the, the funniest like reports I've done is like Heroku is, is one of the companies that actually know about this vulnerability. Like yeah. they know that you're able to claim, claim other Heroku domains. Uh, but, but the fun thing was that Heroku had also one domain that you could claim because they were using another service. So I've been like reporting <laughs> subdomain takeovers to companies having that same sort of yeah. vulnerability, not caring about it, and yeah. and and Heroku was actually paying me for that for that vulnerability, uh, which is ironic since they don't care about their customers having the same vulnerability with them. Yeah. Uh, but they when they had it, they paid out. So <laughs> it's like there's so many <laughs> levels to this, and like I actually I wrote a, a talk about it. And um, what I did was like I, I submitted it to a bunch of security conferences, but nobody actually um, like approved the talk, which was sad. Oh, like yeah. so, so I had a bunch of detailed information about all these services and how they were being vulnerable and stuff, but I was never able to like expose it to people. So, which is kind of sad. And now it's like too yeah. late, uh, at least for like security conferences, I think. But I'll try to like the blog post I'll do is like a revisit on what has happened on, uh, since last time and uh, all these new services doing the same thing. And uh, it's going to be massive, I think, I, hopefully, uh, nice. at least uh, at least in terms of bug bounty hunters, they will be very, very interested in f uh, looking at these new services because, yeah, I think it's going to be uh, a fun, <laughs> fun, fun post. Nice. Um, 
yeah so i would i would also like like to recommend like this uh, matthew uh, matt bryant uh, the mandatory yeah yeah uh, he actually did um, a blog post about digital ocean yep um and i think that applies really well with uh, with your chapter yeah uh, which is which is like on a totally different level talking about dns instead of like domains in like services um also like the the philip harwood bug i think it's, yeah it's not basically a subdomain takeover and it's more more similar to the the facebook connect issue that Neil Goldschlager and Igor Homakov uh, blogged about in like 2013. Yeah, uh, exactly. Which is basically like talking around uh, Facebook apps and the the settings for it. So, um, but yeah, I, I think there's a there's so many levels to it, and like this conflict check thing is also interesting because not only have services had this problem where. Where you're able to claim old domains, having it, being able to claim existing domains is also super interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, so just by because they they were not using a conflict check, you were able to just claim the same domain, and suddenly your content shows up instead of the other people, <laughs> which is like interesting because you you as a company can't really prevent that from happening. You need to get the service to patch that. Exactly. So I had that instance with uh, one of these status. Uh, uh, services showing up the status of your pages. They didn't oh. have a conflict check, uh, and also Etsy releasing their pattern uh, solution. What happened was that you could just go inside and say that this is my pattern URL, and and all the content w uh, for for <laughs> for that e-commerce was showing up, uh, or your content was showing up on that e-commerce website. Really, which is awesome. Yeah. So conflict check is like super super common as well. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so there is there's one thing I want to I want to touch on for those that are listening. Um, and your reference to the the proof of concept. And yeah. one of the things that the reason why I'm going to include the legal robot example was because you went that extra step. And I think this is what differentiates the good bug hunters from the great bug hunters, uh, or at least what I'm starting to see now in having these conversations. So you found the subdomain takeover with legal robot. Um, yeah. Turned out it was already claimed, but then you could take the wild card. And yeah. so not only did you go and actually try to claim it, but then you run into the roadblock of not being able to get that exact subdomain, but you pivot for lack of a better term, kind of think outside the box and then grab the wild card uh, yeah. and take everything. And so yes. for those listening, I think that's, that's a huge takeaway, at least for me. And that's why I want to have it in the book as well. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Like it's uh, it's like depending on what you're using for, for <laughs> that sort of like validation check, uh, you can find some really like there's a there's another way of using like a fully qualified domain name like FQDN. Yeah. A fully qualified domain name ends with a dot, and that's mm -hmm. also one of the instances where okay, so example.com is claimed, but example.com dot is not, hmm. which which like it's it's actually a different domain in terms of cookies and everything. Uh, com, uh, like having the 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 trailing dot is actually a different domain. It's just that in terms of like doing fishing stuff or spear fishing, stuff like that, nobody like cares about that dot. Like having a login page yeah. um, that looks similar to yours on blah 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 dot com dot is actually very very much similar to to having it on the real domain. So in terms mm -hmm. of like doing spear fishing, FQDN uh, ways of doing it, and a lot of these companies or services are vulnerable to that specific thing. Also, we're doing a, we're doing a blog post around um, host header injection. So, okay. host header injection is basically as soon as you request a, a web page or whatever, you send a host uh, header with it. Yeah. And um, there has been some a lot of discussions around host headers and and what you're able to do with them. And and there's been something called web cache poisoning yeah. and password reset vulnerabilities in terms of host header injection. So what happened was that it was like saving a bunch of stuff um, when doing a password reset, which basically meant that when you were clicking the password reset link on the email, it was using the host header that was sent by the attacker. So the attacker could mm -hmm. send a malicious uh, host to the password reset, as soon as somebody clicks on the password reset, the attacker gets uh, the the password request uh, token. 
Hmm. But what, what we identified, me and Matthias, was that both Safari and Internet Explorer has a way to inject malicious data into the host header. And while doing that, we noticed that all, <laughs> some of these services that, that makes it possible to connect domains uh, to them, such as Fastly and Heroku, uh, if you were able to inject a specific amount of characters into the host header, you were able to serve content on another domain than yours, which is like crazy because yeah. that means that you will have SSL served data um, uh, to, a, to content which is not the site's content, but your content uh, because of you injecting malicious data into the host header. Um, and like it's, it's almost patched and we haven't really exposed the way of doing it in the Internet Explorer yet because Internet Explorer version was so much more dangerous than the Safari one. <laughs> I actually exposed the Safari one on my last talk on Security Fest, uh, which is uh, kind of hilarious uh, way of like injecting data into the host header. But uh, yeah, that also turned out to be like we had to actually talk with the service providers because they were like allowing a, a lax parsing of the host header, which actually made it possible to serve another domain's content on a specific domain. Which was hilarious, uh, also. <laughs> Man, uh, oh. yeah. friends, I feel like I could talk to you for hours. Um, yeah, but... of course. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so much fun talking about this stuff. I mean, it's uh, it's no, it's 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 awesome. Exactly. Um, so one of the things that comes to mind, when, like even talking to you, hearing about this, hearing about the blog posts that are coming, um, and this was this stemmed out of the conversation in Vegas as well, uh, where. It was a conversation with with Hackerman about you know what what could be the next steps and yep. you kind of you had some suggestions about working with companies and education and that kind of thing. But my yep. question is really like where does it come from? Like why why share all this information? Why have this interest in making the internet a better place? Like what is it? Why not just kind of hoard it, use it for yourself, um, and yep. rake it in with bug bounties? Um, good question. I mean, I think it's super challenging. I don't think it's super challenging to find the same bug all over the place and just report it. Yeah. And uh, like the challenge for me is like if you if you tell everybody about your tools, that will actually enhance your your ability to find new stuff. Yeah. And also like sharing with other people, they will figure out some other ways of doing it. And hopefully you you put so much um, uh, reason to them that they're actually going to share it share it themselves. Yeah. So by inspiring other people uh, to share data, uh, they will probably most certainly, hopefully, actually share data back to to the community. So I've seen that mm. a lot of times where where you actually share a bunch of data to 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 other people and what you get back. Like I have one one instance that was that was super cool. So I, I made a blog post about bypassing uh, content security policy by by creating a, a SWF that was like a flash file that not only was a flash file but also was a, a, a JavaScript. Okay. Uh, so one system allowed me to upload this SWF and another page allowed me through their CSP to embed data from that domain uh, as JavaScript. Uh, which basically trigger bypass their CSP, mm -hmm. um, and what happened was that I told people that okay, it's super hard to do this with JPEGs and and GIFs, uh, but the interesting thing that one guy actually came came uh, and re responded, and he's like, no, it's not, and I'm like, yeah, because the, the limitation of the of the image needs to be this and that for it to be able to inject uh, JavaScript, and he was yeah. like, no, no, you don't, because there's there's uh, there's multiple headers in a, in a GIF that one tells you about the context area and one tells you about the, 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 the dimensions of the real image. So, yeah. so a, a GIF basically consists of uh, this is the content area and this is, this is the content I want to show. And these headers were placed differently in the, in the GIF. And, and you, utilizing what he did, I was able to actually create uh, create like uh, 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 <laughs> like the, independently of size that you wanted, you were able to upload it and validating the size properly uh, for, for that service. So just by sharing my 
like my my problems using an image uh, yeah. he actually told me about ways of doing it and he actually like started doing some some open source solution into like create your own payload thing for for jpegs oh. and and gifs so that actually created something that that he actually could work for, further on and made yeah. me learn a lot around like how the headers work in in image formats um and this was like about like polyglots and like how how do you make a a JPEG also work as a JavaScript and, and stuff like that. So it, that was super, super valuable for me. And I would never have known all that tricks if I wouldn't have shared my blog post around the SWF uh, CSP thing. Nice. nice. Yeah. That's so awesome. that's, I, I would say that's, that's one of the biggest reasons. Like you, you create, you create uh, data and people will create more data around that and share it with you, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think yeah. that's at least my short time. That's what I've been noticing. Um, you know, you tend to help people and um, people end up helping you back, right? Um, yeah. You kind of want to treat others the way you want to be treated. So that makes a lot Absolutely. of sense. Yeah. So I think the, the last thing before we kind of sign off is somebody brand new, friends, comes to you today or tomorrow and says, listen, I'm brand new to bug bounties. What's your advice to them? Like, I, I try to tell people that reading is so much valuable uh, because that has worked out for me. Yeah. The problem with reading is, like, it tends to make it very theoretical. Um, yeah. And it's really hard to, like, use the stuff that you read to use them practically. So that's why I'm actually telling people to try out these, like, web capture the flag things. Yeah. Um, and like the, the reason why capture the flag didn't work for me is like I, I probably never um, under, like th th there's a difference for me like uh, when I know that there's a vulnerability that that makes like because CTFs um, like th the reason behind the CTF is that there's a solution. Yeah, and and that gets me so frustrated. So <laughs> I can't really focus because I'm like, okay, you know, you want me to yeah. to find the, the specific thing, and the, the, com compare that to a, a bug bounty or actually approaching a company, uh, you actually don't know if there's a vulnerability there or not. It's yeah. it's your mission to actually figure it out if there is or not, um, which gets me more triggered than knowing that somebody else is trying to be smarter than you. <laughs> um, instead, trying to be smarter than someone without actually knowing if you're able to or not, it, yeah. it's, it's a bigger chance for me. So CTFs tend to be something that I recommend just because trying to get the hunch on what it's all about. Yeah. Also, like this, like Google Gruyere yeah. thing is like awesome to just get a feeling on on what what companies actually looking for and how vulnerabilities actually are being found and. Like I did this uh, assessment, the practical assessment for for signing up for Cynic. Okay. And and they have like a practical assessment where you get a virtual machine and you're able you you should like hack the web application and that was like similar to the Gruyere thing, uh, okay. really good for me because I was super scared on doing it because I I didn't want to fail. Yeah. So I actually waited a really long time of doing it bef uh, b before I actually had the guts to do it because. I wanted to learn more about like insecure direct object references and mm. all these stuff. So what I did was like I waited for almost four months or something f before I did it, yeah. uh, just because I wanted to learn about like all these sorts of vulnerabilities. So like blog posts is is super valuable for me uh, personally, and yeah. I think CTFs should be because th they they are so practical. You can actually uh, play with them to figure out, and also like reading. CTF uh, write-ups is, is super yeah. valuable because not only do you probably have the CTF so you can try it yourself, you also have the write-ups so you're actually able to replicate what they've done. Yeah. So what, what was interesting was that um, there was a, a, a talk on Black Hat um, this year about, um, uh, let's see, F, um, FFmpeg maybe? Okay. Um, the, 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 like this uh, application where you're able to convert videos to uh, uh, other formats and stuff. I think it's FFmpeg, right? Yeah. 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 So, so there was a vulnerability that was exposed in the Black Hat talk about one way of doing remote code execution through FFmpeg. Yeah. And it, it turned out that one captured a flag back in 2015 actually had that as a, a challenge. Yes. 
uh, which is hilarious. Like the, the companies were actually vulnerable from 2015 to this day when Black Hat, they exposed it on Black Hat. And, and all the people that actually found, found out through the CTF were able to actually go inside companies and do remote code execution on them uh, without anybody knowing that this was actually a, a real threat, uh, which is super interesting. So that also makes it uh, like really interesting to actually approach CTFs because you can actually learn about vulnerabilities that is actually out there right now. Yeah, no, and if memory serves, I think one of the blog articles that I read was somebody doing the CTF and finding the flag through the FM, uh, the, yeah. the, um, the vul through that vulnerability, but that wasn't yeah. how he was supposed to find the flag. Ah, interesting. And oh, so hilarious. I don't know if it was the same article, but yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah. It, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. And one of yeah. the big thing takeaways that I had, and this was a learning that I had in Vegas as well, uh, kind of seeing other people who, uh, you know, are very successful, is uh, for CTFs, I find they help you build that resiliency. Um, I don't know if it's yeah. the age of Google or what it is, but it's kind of maybe it's the programmer background. But if you can't solve something, quick Google search, Stack Exchange tells you how to do it. You're off to the races. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. I don't know, maybe doing that for a few years, it's just kind of killed that resiliency. And so yeah. now it's like you go to hack something and it's like, oh, I can't do it five, ten minutes. Okay, I'm just going to move on to another program or another yeah. area of the app. But CTS yeah. focus you, uh, make you yeah. sit there. Absolutely. And uh, like there's been many, many instances where, where I've been, I'm getting stuck and just move on and like save it in, inside a text file like i should probably look at this later on yeah and and then i tend to that's also one of the reasons why i tend to like revisit stuff it's like i go through that list sometimes and just like oh that was something and and maybe i've learned something more going through that list compared to the time when i put it in that list so yeah. that also tends to to be one way for me to actually like revisit stuff um, and uh, makes it possible to me to actually find some old stuff that was vulnerable before, but I didn't know how to actually exploit them. And, and now I do. So, yeah. No, that's a great point. And again, big pro tip because uh, actually yeah. that was my first experience doing that the other night. Uh, unfortunately, somebody oh, cool. reported <laughs> it when I went back to it, but yeah. uh, it was the same thing where I, I found it actually, it was, it was a Tomcat Maybe you're the one that found it, friends, because I know it was on a private <laughs> program, and there's like there's only a few people on there, and I think you're one of them oh, as well. Oh, interesting. And okay. so, um, anyways, it, it was the Tomcat example. I think okay, or yeah. you had it, and so yeah, they yeah, had yeah. The, the Tomcat example application up, and so you could yeah. set cookies and that kind of thing. And yeah. I, I knew it was vulnerable. I thought it was going to be Java deserialization, and so I flagged mm -hmm. it in the burp. And I figured I'd come back to it, and then somebody disclosed it with OKRU, and I learned, and I was like, "Oh, you can set cookies." Okay, yes. got home, loaded up Burp, went and find it. They turned off the the example application in what was ah. you know a day or two. So somebody's clearly ah, reported it. Interesting. Yeah. So there's um, yeah, that Tomcat example is is very very interesting. I one company that I actually found that example files for, I was like, "Holy shit! Why is is this exposed by this company?" And yeah. I started looking at it and I was like, this, this is not this company. <laughs> and, and I was like, why, is, why do they have this subdomain pointing to this application? Because not only did it have like a, a Tomcat example file, it yeah. also had like a very, very vulnerable uh, like team, um, how do you say, like, uh, uh, like webcam, uh, connect like you can like team up and talk with each other yeah. like a conference call application yeah and I was like this is not this company so I reported to them like okay so you have probably like Tomcat example files you have a SQL injection and holy shit this is not yours right yeah and it turned out to be like they they pointed their domain to an IP on on EC2 and <laughs> and they forgot about it and suddenly <laughs> another application turns up on that specific IP yeah. and and they were like, oh shit. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I think in the title it was like SQL injection on this and that. And like they, they I've never seen them respond that fast. <laughs> but it turned out to be a, a different company actually owning that IP at that time. So huh. that was pretty interesting. And that was only because I found that Tomcat example file, which was interesting. Wow. 
Yeah. Well, friends, um, that kind of rounds out the the questions that I had for you. Um, I oh, know no worries. No worries. I, I definitely went over your time. We're at uh, one hour and 23 minutes, I think, here. Um, and I know uh, you're outside in the cold. So, again, I, I – well, I guess as cold as it, it, it is. I knew you had to put on the jacket. Just, yeah, um, I have a jacket, but it's like still summer in Sweden. But I don't know if summer in Sweden is actually qualified of, of calling itself summer. I don't know. <laughs> nice. I just – again, I want to reiterate my thanks for you. I really appreciate you not only taking the time – but also yeah, doing you. so while your family are sleeping um, and then yeah. finding the mutual time that worked for both of us. I really appreciate awesome. it and, and all that you've, you've shared. So thanks yeah, very no much. Worries, Peter. Thank you so much. Take okay. care. You as well.